Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this exclusive webinar for premium banking clients organized by Standard Chartered Bank. At the onset, on behalf of the bank, I would first like to thank you all for joining in this webinar, and we look forward to your active participation. Today's webinar, we look into the world of mutual funds. Through this webinar, we aim to help you understand mutual funds and its varied benefits, from defining different asset classes and the various categories to understanding your risk appetite in helping you assist in your investment journey and for meeting your financial goals. We have it all covered here. And who better than Mr. Amar Shah, who joins us for this webinar. Amar Shah is the head of retail business at ICICI Prudential AMC and is a veteran of the industry with over 13 years experience in senior roles in ICIC Prudential. In his current role, Amar is responsible for driving the business in the retail segment and uh, Pan-India, primary administering distributors as well as investor concerns. Thank you, Amar, for joining. Thank you. And Vinay. over to you. Thank you, Vinay. And uh, once again, a very, very warm welcome. And uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk to uh, each one of us and talking a little bit about mutual funds and, you know, uh, telling that how this is one of the best superior vehicle to uh, achieve your financial goals, achieve your investment objectives, etc. Uh, etc. Uh, Vinay, before I thought, uh, you know, we take some questions, I, I just wanted to put across a point over here uh, about why this mutual fund and how, why investing, actually the core is why investing is extremely, extremely important. And, and mutual fund, of course, is a beautiful vehicle, very, very well managed. But uh, so let me begin with one small story that I thought has played out in my life and I'm very, very sure most of you will relate to it. Uh, right from my childhood, I have I have grown up with a piggy bank and uh, you know, you get these small bits of monies, uh, sometimes as pocket money or sometimes during Diwali when you go and or any festival when you go and visit your relatives and you know, the elders give you that money and culturally, uh, I had grown up and most of us as, as Indians uh, grew up with the culture of habit of saving, right? And for us, uh, what we have been taught all throughout our life is that save money and, and it will be useful, helpful on a, on a rainy day. So we have all grown up with that piggy bank, saving some money, breaking it, opening it when we need to spend it and once again restart that whole process. At least that's how I have grown. and. Uh, as a child, uh, my parents never taught me the concept of inflation, right? And uh, jokingly, I now tell my father that uh, there used to be days when we will refresh those memories and he will say during my time that samosa was available for 25 pesa and, and the fare of that uh, bus in which I used to go was 5 pesa, 10 pesa, etc, etc. And that same samosa will cost us anywhere between 20 rupees on a street side to uh, three digits uh, if you go to a renowned restaurant. So what is that? And that is what is inflation. So we have never been taught culturally that correlation that look, the money that you're keeping and putting it into that piggy bank has same value. But what you want to purchase with that money, the value of that has changed completely. Uh, and uh, you can look at anything in your life, right? Whether you look at uh, your basics that you need to uh, technology that you buy to luxuries that you buy, uh, the inflation beautifully kicks in. And uh, that inflation uh, historically in India has been at the rate of on an average 5 to 6%. To me, which only says that the 100 rupees that you have today is becoming 96 rupees in terms of its ability to buy something. And that's where investing comes in because uh, if we want to beat inflation, then we want to, we want that piggy bank money to make more than inflation. So if that inflation is at, or your uh, prices of goods and commodities are increasing by, you know, five to 6% every year, the money lying in piggy bank does not grow at the rate of 5-6%. And another beautiful component that we all miss out is that there are taxes. So even if this money grows at an X rate, 
after that you have to pay taxes on that and hence ideally one needs to invest in a very very disciplined way because all our financial goals of today or all our goals in life today whether it's it's buying a house buying a car educating our children so on and so forth uh, the cost of that goal will always go up by the time you reach that goal because all our goals will be medium to long term so in order to beat that it is very important that we look at investing very very seriously uh, and look at generating you know what uh, we used to say that make your money work as hard as you do and that whole whole process of uh, generating that returns is extremely important and uh, what best but mutual fund as a vehicle to you know go and achieve that so uh, there is beautiful products there are brilliant products that get created through that mutual fund umbrella and i'm going to talk a little bit more about it as we go ahead but uh, to come to the point mutual fund is one of the best vehicles to to beat that inflation to invest that money and make sure that your concept of purchasing power remains same as it is uh, today thanks amar yeah. was uh, that's a very good introduction uh, you you stated on inflation obviously that's one benefit yes. the other benefit which uh, uh, of mutual funds could be diversification yes. right because yes. you can grow beyond stocks beyond bonds yes. you get into a basket yes. so could you elaborate on that how does diversification sure. help in short sure. short sure. so uh, the saying that they say uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket right and mutual fund beautifully ensures that does not happen uh, which means that it's a it's a vehicle where uh, there is two types of diversification i call it one diversification of customers which means that it's not one individual buying something there are huge set of individuals they pool the money together give it to a professional manager which is a asset management company which floats the scheme with a particular objective and that scheme when it goes and invests into any of the asset classes whether it is equities whether it is you know bonds or interest bearing instruments uh by regulation as well as by design it is diversified which only means that there is huge pool of customers who come together put the money create into a particular scheme which has objective and that scheme on the other side goes and buys set of shares or set of bonds depending on the objective of the scheme and the beauty about diversification is that it somewhere brings a bit of a stability to the portfolio because today no one can predict future with certainty if i know that if i buy this only one stock and this is the going to be the best performing stock i think somebody tells you that that person is lying right and you can never have only a a company doing very very well you will always have different set of companies from different sectors performing very very well so mutual fund by regulation and by design diversifies the portfolio and that reduces risk drastically because uh if something has to go wrong it just happens on a portion of the portfolio and there is the rest of the portfolio that takes care of that one thing that goes wrong so as a as a mutual fund you of course do your research you do your due diligence etc etc but there is something called as unknown unknown or unseen right something that you cannot visualize at this point of time so that diversification protects that risk beautifully uh, of course mutual fund has its own set of many of the advantages that we will talk as we go ahead but diversification i would only say that it gives you much more stability and it it just goes against that whole or it goes with the concept of don't put all your eggs in one basket because that's a risk right if the basket falls everything breaks if you have some plotted in a different way you are there you have some meat to sure uh we have quite a few questions flowing so we can sure, start we taking can start that. Yes. Uh, the first question is with this whole recent reclassification of funds yes uh how do we understand and how do we map the new old classification and why has sebi undertaken this is this a positive step for the mutual fund industry as a whole oh uh, 
I would say it is extremely positive and uh, first let me say that we have a very 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 vigilant regulator uh, completely pro customer and I think every step that the regulator takes is keeping in mind customer's interest. Uh, this diverse uh, scheme classification, uh, the way we look at it, uh, SEBI has told us and now all mutual funds have put their schemes into different, different, different compartments. And I think earlier I would say uh, there could have been a possibility of some confusion that, you know, what am I buying? What is the objective of the scheme, etc, etc. Uh, today with this classification, I think everything has got into a compartment. So. Uh, if your objective is is a uh, very 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 long term then there is a small cap as a category and you know that you're buying a small cap fund you know that uh, you know you will get this much percentage of small cap at all points of time into that portfolio if your objective is to buy a large cap fund it's completely separate if you want to buy a blended fund then you have a large and mid cap if you want to give the mandate to fund manager to decide how much large cap, how much mid cap and give him a lot of flexibility. You have a multi cap fund. So I think it has helped uh, uh, for the customer to understand products better, to do right comparisons uh, if they have to compare because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, a small cap fund will be compared with a large cap index and so on and so forth. And not necessary that, you know, uh, a small cap share stocks and a large cap stocks move in a very similar fashion. So I think it's a great move. Uh, it gives a lot of clarity to the customer awesome. and uh, and the scheme objectives are defined so it's good for the customer in the long so even run. given his risk profile he can fit uh, uh, funds according absolutely. to his absolutely 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 the other one is on uh, uh, with the ltcg regime coming in uh, yes. uh, how do does equity as a mutual fund category still remains attractive compared to the other the ltcg i can only on a lighter note say it's still the lowest tax Right. I mean, the kind of taxes that we pay are way, way, way higher and uh, there are no alternatives at 10% tax. So, uh, is it unattractive compared to earlier era? Yes, to the extent of 10%. But uh, I think two, three things have happened uh, with the LTCG coming in. Uh, my view is that uh, you need to define a horizon and stick to your horizon. Uh, and with the LTCG coming in, well, you're going to pay only when you book, but if you have a long term horizon, then how does it matter? I think it's just 10 percentage. And uh, uh, I would only say that it's still one of the lowest tax regime. Equity funds continue to be staying, stay attractive. I was just saying today, uh, we are in 2018 and 2008, 10 years back was peak. Uh, had you bought mutual fund schemes at the peak also, you're still making a compounding of you know 10 10 and a half percent at this point of time yes. from that peak till now so 10 percent tax is not too big a hindrance as far as you can get your horizon and get your scheme selection and then get your performance i think even when you move into the horizon a longer term horizon more than 10 years generally equity mutual funds have given uh, whether la if you take the large cap which yes. is the most safest category yes. uh, they have also given around uh, 12 to 13 percent return. Yes, so absolutely. even if you take a 10 percent tax on that, it is still uh, the real return is very high compared to the absolutely. other side. Absolutely. You still beat the inflation by 5 percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other question is on uh, index and managed funds. Uh, yes. Uh, should we have both? Which one preference is there? Uh, yeah. So how do we uh, do that? On index and managed funds? Well, there is room for both. Uh, I have no doubt about it. Um, uh, I, I, I will be extremely honest and transparent that the index funds come way cheaper for the customer than the managed fund. Managed funds charge you slightly higher fees. But then uh, the managed funds also uh, have an objective to outperform the index, right? And if you see historically on a medium to long term basis, most of the mutual fund schemes have beaten the index. So it does not really pinch to pay slightly higher fees because eventually I'm still making more, more money. money. How yes. does it matter? Right? There is room for both. Uh, there will be set of themes within index. So if somebody wants to just buy a nifty 500 on one side or somebody wants to say that 
look, I want to just buy these 50 stocks only and I don't want to deviate from the index. I just don't want to give my money to anybody. Then there are index funds that are available. Uh, but I would, at this point of time, I would only say that uh, the managed funds, if you have a long-term horizon, is a better choice for the degree of flexibility and the intelligence of fund manager that you want to put. Sure. Uh, another question, this has come on uh, corporate bonds, is uh, these different categories, you have different rating. Yes. Double A, Triple yes. A, and all. Yes. So, how does an investor look at that? What is the difference? So, how does he see in the corporate bond space? So, in corporate bond, uh, first of all, in bond, there are uh, uh, two areas of risk, and again, there are the areas of gain. Let me go a little theoretical here. Uh, lower the rating, higher will be your return, but at the same time, higher is the risk. And in bonds, there are two risks. Uh, one is the interest rate risk which is the price risk and second is the default risk. Uh, so the lower the rating, higher is the default risk but so will higher be the return. And uh, another area that one needs to look at the bond is uh, longer the bond maturity, more is the sensitivity to the changes in the interest rate and interest rates don't remain same, uh, you know they keep on changing. So my uh, way of looking at it is. Um, uh, in, see anyways you are giving money to mutual fund and mutual funds also have both these category of funds, uh, both these category of fixed income products uh, which invest into high rated bonds or which invest into non AAA rated bonds and uh, the what we do as a, as a if I can at least comment on as a fund out that every time we buy or create a portfolio of non AAA bonds so we are adding little bit to the risk on the credits default, we cut down the interest rate risk completely. So we basically ensure that we don't buy very long bond. When we are going down the rating curve, we lend the money only for one year, two years, three years. And when we lend the money to AAA person, we increase the duration of the portfolio, which means we give money for a longer period. I think from the investor's perspective, uh, I would say that uh, the the non AAA rated portfolio with very low duration will give a slightly more stable return because the sensitivity to interest rates is very very low and hence it is more of accruing the money. money. So if the bonds are getting 9% rate of interest then 9% minus the expense of the scheme is ideally the performance that the customer gets. Over here you make money out of interest rate. Sure. So, I would choose either depending on my risk appetite and my time horizon. If my time horizon is slightly shorter, I would stay on a stable one. If I can stay for the long time, I leave it to the fund manager to each money out of the interest rates. Rate. So this is a very common question, I think. Uh, what percentage of your income should you invest in mutual funds? Uh, is there some formula or a ballpark number how much of your income you should ideally invest in mutual funds? Yeah, so uh, I would I would say what would I do, right? I get a set of income and I know my expenses um, that are there and after that I'll bring in mutual fund at some point. After that I have a pool of money which I need to invest, right? And I'm underlying the word invest over here. Within that investment I typically create uh, three categories. I create a category called as contingency funds which means that look I may need this money at any point of time, right? What I want to take a trip in next six months, what if you know something happens to my health, etc, etc. So you create a contingency fund. Then you have your you know short term needs typically that look I, I have a son who is now 12 years old. I know that you know five, six years down the line I may need money if I have to send him for some higher education. And then you have a long term goal where you I would say that I, I want to buy a house. Uh, I want to buy my second house. I want to maybe change my locality, I want to buy a bigger house, etc, etc. So I, moment I bucket this money in, in this three possible way, uh, to answer how much money should I invest to mutual fund, I can say that you can invest the entire pool into mutual fund. Because mutual funds have all these three category of products. You will have a very liquidity management product in mutual fund available. You will have a fixed income oriented product available in mutual fund to take care of your three to five year goal. You will have an equity oriented solution. Uh, to take care of your 10 year goal. So there is no formula. I would say that if the vehicle is uh, available to me at a right price, it m helps me to achieve my goal, it is professionally managed, 
it is very well controlled it is extremely transparent it is extremely liquid do does anything go wrong and i need everything today it gives me back mutual fund gives you all so why not everything to mutual fund so the other uh, other question we've got is suppose you have a kitty suppose 9 to 10 lakhs the yeah. investment horizon is 10 to 15 years yes uh, how many funds should i have what type of allocation should you do yeah. in such a case so if i have a uh, uh, x kitty in this case say 10 lakh rupees um, and if we are thumping the table saying that this is a 10 year money i would put all of that into equity and within that equity i would assign some percentage to mid cap say 20 30 percentage to mid cap or maybe even 40 because the horizon is 10 years plus and balance 60 would be bought between large cap and a flexi cap and uh, that's how I'll create a proper portfolio of it. And uh, yeah, I would just write the. Did there yeah. was a second question to this uh, thing. Or no, this no? is the one. Uh, the second uh, means somewhat related to this is also is uh, when should you start investing in mutual funds and uh, how should the strategy be for like the current volatile market? Should you wait, start now, wait for correction? How okay. does a investor try to see this through? Yes. So. A, when do you start? I think Monday morning 9, 9 a.m. <laughs> is when you start for sure and make sure that you call your banker and take the advice on the weekend if required, you know. Uh, so there is no definition of when do I start. I think what to do in the market, uh, well, you know, I don't have a set answer for that for the simple reason that uh, it actually depends on what your current asset allocation is at this point of time. So for someone like me, at this point of time, I have almost 50-55% into equity as a cat, as asset class and balances into fixed income. So what am I going to do on Monday morning if I get this set of money or if I have money? I will stick to that asset allocation. So I'm going to buy 55 rupees worth of equity. I'm going to buy 45 worth of equity. And of course, in this, I have considered my age, my future earnings, etc. There's a, there's, a, there's a plan that I have. Uh, but if you are already 80% onto equity on Monday morning, don't add into equity in the current market environment, right? Because markets are not very, very cheap. They have done very, very well in the last yes. four years. Yes. And you also have a uh, event coming in. Uh, well, it does not change anything for the country. Life works, life goes on. Companies will continue to do well. But markets do react to events, and which is you have elections in next nine months to ten months from here. So uh, if you're over invested equity, I would not say you should go in for equity. In fact, uh, maybe you can look at reducing a little bit equity to your asset allocation, right? Yes. It's not, at this valuation, it's not worth carrying 80-90% equity. But otherwise, stick to asset allocation. Uh, Monday morning, it can be bought. As far as you're managing fixed income and equity or, 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 or you're investing into products which automatically manage yeah, asset allocation, allocation, you know, the balance category and balance advantage advantage. category, I think you're sorted. But you should invest now. So, the uh, couple of questions yes. from uh, retired people. So, sure. uh, one is uh, uh, is that a particular one of our clients was getting a good uh, return on his fixed deposit of 7.75, but now he shifted into mutual funds and the, his first year returns have been lower than what you have got. So how does, is it a reason to worry? Is there need to rejig or we should wait it out uh, for this period? What's the time horizon? I think, I think one should wait it out uh, for the simple reason that uh, uh, I think one year is too short a period yes. and one year is too short a period and brings in uh, volatility. Uh, it's part of the game because eventually uh, the returns of mutual fund are linked to how the market performs but the job of the fund manager is to try to beat the market, right? Uh, I would be lying if I say that, you know, if markets fall by 10%, my return will be positive 10%. I think it's, it's very, very unlikely, right? But at the same time, I just gave an example very recently uh, that if you bought in 2008, which was peak of oh equity, my. that last peak of equity, you're still doing a compounding of, you know, 10% and that 10% I told you in index, you rightly said that if you had bought even a plain vanilla large cap fund, you were making 12, 13 percent. So I think give time to your investments. Uh, don't panic. In fact, before investing, just write down once on a piece of paper for yourself that why am I investing this money for and 
for how long am I investing this money? So if you if you documented your own time horizon and every time you get jittery, go back and look at that paper. And as far as you're still from the time that you invested, give time to your investors. The second one is related to uh, SWP or uh, as some investors might not be systematic withdrawal plan. Yeah. So how uh, uh, how much sense is an SWP good for a retirement planner? And is there any negatives with uh, when you're considering an SWP plan? So, uh, till tax came in, a uh, dividend was a better way to withdraw money because dividend was coming to you tax free uh, with the 10% tax that has come on dividend and I'm right now on equity as an asset class. Uh, SWP makes uh, immense sense because, uh, uh, see let's be very very honest over here, the dividend that the scheme pays is out of your own profits, right? It is your own money that you get back in the form of dividend when you get it from mutual fund. So SWP today uh, works like your your home loan, right? Uh, a reverse of home loan. In a home loan, what do you do? When you pay a EMI, you pay a huge, huge chunk of interest and very little capital. And in mutual fund, when you do SWP, it actually works reverse. It removes huge chunk of your initial investment and little bit of appreciation. Because that appreciation is so little, on that little appreciation, you have to pay little tax. Yeah. And it becomes a very tax efficient way. And uh, yeah, it takes care of your cash flow. I think that it's a great way to, but do the product selection. Very product, right. yeah. You cannot buy a mid cap, small cap equity fund and start the AWP day one. You have not even allowed it to grow. So buy a very, very, very conservative fund and then do it. I think even with SWP is if you are closer to retirement, you can start moving from equity into more debt asset Absolutely. or accrual funds, Absolutely. which will give you Absolutely. regular income, which is Absolutely. There. related to this only there's a question on dividend and growth. So you alluded to that. Uh, so yeah. what is uh, as a first time investor now, should you be in a growth plan more than a dividend plan considering where the taxation is also? I think, uh, I think I would advise with the change in tax, I would advise a growth plan. Uh, because whether you buy a dividend fund, uh, so let me put it this way, in mutual funds, let's break it down into two parts, equity funds, fixed income funds. On the equity funds, uh, dividends are taxed at the rate of 10%, even your long term gain is taxed at the rate of 10%. However, the first 1 lakh rupees you don't get taxed and then you pay tax on the you know further appreciation to that. So I think it will make more sense to be growth because eventually still on that small amount of 1 lakh rupees I am not going to pay tax. Plus. Uh, in growth option, I'm going to pay tax only when I remove the money. In dividend option, every time you declare the dividend in between, you will pay that 10% tax. Uh, on the fixed income side also, I would stick to growth option for the simple reason that in a dividend option, you there is a distribution tax and that's at full margin, uh, that's at full rate, that's at 30% percentage plus, 30% percent plus GST, etc, etc. Whereas in the growth option, if I have completed three years, then it gets classified as long-term capital gains. Uh, you pay only 20% tax after adjusting for indexation. Sure. So it's extremely attractive to be in growth option with a three-year plus. If you remove money before three years for whatever reason, anyways, you're paying same tax as you would have paid in the video. So I'm all out for growth option. So I think this answers one more question which we got uh, for a retail investor and yes. debt funds. Uh, in this, uh, maybe in a falling interest rate uh, scenario it's good but in a rising rate uh, does it be whether to park in FDs is it better or whether we keep it in few uh, do we take debt funds I think taxation makes a big difference taxation uh, tax makes a huge, huge difference huge. so you just to summarize you get a lot of uh, the indexation benefit which yes. you could you explain that how the indexation so I'll, yes I'll give you the example uh, I said uh, in India average inflation has been 5 to 6 percent, right? Uh, last few years index inflation has been about 4 percent, before that it was actually 9 percent, uh, hence I said average is 6. So indexation is nothing but your cost of inflation, right? So imagine buying a fixed income fund or first let's talk about a deposit. Right? You bought a deposit at 8 percentage and you are paying full tax. So effectively almost more than 30 percent gets knocked off. For the simplicity I will say that 8 percentage will translate into 5.5 percent tax free. I have knocked off 2.5 percent worth of taxes from that 8 percent return. So every 8 percent will become 5.5 percent. Now on the fixed income side, 
uh, as I said, if you stay for three years, you uh, you pay tax at the rate of 20% with indexation benefits. So let's say our three-year return is even on fixed income side 8% in the fixed income mutual fund. So you have made 24% in three years uh, in a simple way and your indexation is at 5% which is your average inflation. So effectively you pay 20% tax only on 3% extra return. You made 8%, index is 5%, your incre extra return is 3%. So on, on that three percent, the tax at the rate of twenty is is only 0 0.60. So your eight becomes seven point four or seven point three. Now five and a half and seven point three post tax you made two percent extra. Now, yes, I understand that interest rate goes up. Sometimes debt funds don't give you that entire eight percent, but tax but it. tax two percent. You have a leeway to drop the returns by two percent, and you'll still be at par with that. Why not take that chance? Tax. So similarly for uh, so uh, for a retirement person or person, so how does how does he do with if he gets a retirement corpus and all is mutual funds uh, a good investment for him in that case? Yes. Uh, so for a retired person, my advice would be that be skewed more towards debt. Uh, at the end of it, uh, uh, you know it it will give you possibly in a long term slightly lesser return than equity but it will give you a lot more stability into your portfolio. It will reduce uh, short term risks to a large extent or so have a skewed portfolio towards fixed income maybe buy uh, if I have 100 rupees of my retirement corpus um, I would put almost 70 rupees 60 to 70 rupees into debt funds and balance 30 to 40 into large cap funds. That is one way I can do. Or I pick up an asset allocation fund. There are right now products which, uh, you know, do automatic asset allocation adjustment based on, you know, market. If equity is expensive, they reduce equity in their portfolio. If equity is cheap, they add equity into their portfolio. So add money completely over there. You have both the routes. Uh, one question now going to a little bit of basic. Uh, should you look at NAV when you are deciding to invest in mutual funds? How do you solve this problem of NAV when people? No, it? not at all. NAV is nothing but today's value of your portfolio. Now, uh, if I started my scheme in 1990, my my NAV will be way, way, way higher compared to a scheme that started in 2007. For the simple reason that you know if entire appreciation is into NAV. But at the end of it, whether 1999 started scheme has a 200 rupees NAV and a 2007 has 50 rupees of NAV, it doesn't matter because at the end of it, that NAV is nothing but the price of underlying shares. And suppose that underlying share was a single share, say HDFC bank, then that 200 rupees is equal to price of HDFC bank and this 50 rupees is equal to price of HDFC bank. So when HDFC bank appreciate by 10%, 50 is going to become 55 rupees, 200 is going to become 220 rupees. You are going to make the same amount of money. So NAV is just not important at all. What is important is what you are buying, is this meeting your financial objective and are you staying put and sticking to your yes. business. Yeah. Uh, so is there any risk matrix available for a first time investor? How to identify what is high risk, low risk funds and all. I think the SEBI classification makes it much easier. Yes, yes. So uh, I can, I can, I can in a very quick way just say that lot of these money market funds which I call you should invest for your contingency at the lowest possible risk. They buy into very, very, very AAA oriented portfolio and uh, uh, with only two month maturity. Uh, so there is a fixed income curve which says that I will buy best premium quality papers with the lowest maturity to all the way buying a gilt or a 10 year bond and that's how the risk matrix goes that brings in volatility. On the equity side you have uh, it starts from a hybrid fund which buys you know 75-80% debt 20% equity and goes all the way up to a small cap fund and I would say small cap fund by design may have slightly higher risk for the nature of companies that it invests sure. into they are much more volatile uh, they swing in each direction much more um, i think more important is that you take your risk taking test yeah. 
and then decide where your ability to absorb shocks and horizon is and based on that buy the firm so i think at standard chartered we can uh, our advisors can help in uh, getting you start with your investments so at the end of uh, just quickly uh, at the end of this uh, session we will be sending in a feedback form so in case you want to know about more or sure. detail on mutual funds we will, our advisors would be happy to help you uh, moving quickly to some other questions uh, uh, on lump sum sip and stp yes so how do you do with in a debt or liquid fund do you do lump sum uh, that's one of the first questions so what, how do you answer that uh, debt for debt or liquid maybe liquid is it lump sum better or do we yeah, yeah 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 liquid because i said that it is the lowest point on volatility lowest point on risk liquid is equal to completely triple a portfolio with a two year maturity i mean you can't go wrong right so lump sum liquid is equal to lump sum for sure and uh, as far as debt is concerned i don't see any uh, reason why you should do sip uh, or stp unless until you have a view that you know interest rates will go up and hence i may get better opportunities in the future you are extremely certain then you say i will buy staggered because i can't time, time. Yeah. i can't time but otherwise i would go uh, lump sum into fixed income and leave it to the fund house or a mutual fund to do the best job on my money and stp uh, when do you do an stp in a equity based fund i would do stp when i believe that there is uncertainty in which direction the market is going uh, with a slightly bias of downward uh, then i would actually plug in stp and i will say look i don't want to buy everything today yeah. i am not very sure i believe there are volatile times ahead so i want to uh, buy higher or lower but i i'm not sure so i'm going to do stp uh sometimes yeah i i think that's the one for sip my my view is uh uh just to add uh, uh there are two things one is of course the concept of averaging and uh, long term investing but sometimes also linked to cash flow so especially someone like me who's salaried may just do sip because i know that my cash flow is going to come exactly on 30th and i want the discipline it, it is it is to be invested on 30th so i'll just do that sip so it's also linked to sometimes cash flow but stp you do it when you are uncertain no so uh, uh, how many uh, so then the on sip there's a question how many sip should you do like how much how many how many mutual funds can you have in your basket and what is the That's, ideal number yes. which you can have so i i would say mutual fund scheme itself is diversification so if you are buying a large cap fund the large cap fund anyways is be 50 60 stocks for you right so you are anyways buying by buying one scheme you are buying 60 different companies or 50 different companies. I would not add more than four or five schemes into my portfolio, because over diversification and there is data that says that when you over diversify your money, uh, your returns are suboptimal. It is better to listen to your advisor, let him select the best four or five schemes for you, and stick to that four or five. A large cap scheme of a X mutual fund and a large cap scheme of Y mutual fund will have. 60 70% 80% portfolio common right i mean if you are a large cap scheme you better have maybe a hdfc bank into it hdfc so what is the point of buying the same stock from two different managers so four or five scheme let let standard chartered bank uh, advisor uh, or your your relationship person tell you which are those best four schemes suited for you how uh, switching between different funds uh, yeah. equity into debt Uh, how often how frequent you should do this so ideally uh, the there are two reasons and triggers that i would look at for switching a uh, i have my as i am aging and as my corpus is getting built and as my objectives are getting fulfilled i keep on changing my asset allocation right so i will be very very aggressive at the age of 30 because i know that i have another 30 35 years of my working life to make money i will buy a lot more equity than fixed income but my same gentleman as or 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 lady or individual as he progress in life he needs to change the second trigger to change asset allocation can be when the asset becomes very very overheated so so there will be times when uh, you know markets become very very irrational so your interest rates goes to a lowest point which means fixed income has got overheated or your equity market valuations goes through the roof that's the time you rebalance your asset allocation and 
you by design have to do it because uh, imagine you bought 50 50 rupees and equity gives super normal return and, and you know the portfolio of the equity side appreciated so much that your ratio by default became 60 40 maybe you rebalance 10 rupees maybe you say i want to stick to 50 50 and something that has happened very very quickly i'll rebalance it and come back to where i want it of course you take care of taxation load time horizon etc etc et but uh, you know, one very interesting thing right now that has happened in the industry in last three years, I would say, is that these auto asset allocation funds have come in. Yeah. You know, so they solve a lot of these problems in a very, very efficient way. Yeah. Where uh, the fund itself sells when it's the market the goes up and, you know, buys when the market comes down. Uh, what we call it is, you know, make them like a fill it, shut it, forget it fund. That the Hero Honda ad, right? Yeah. Something like that. So. I think that's another choice where you don't need to worry too much about your question of when do I rebalance. What about uh, thematic sectoral fronts? How do you how do we play this? And is it is it good for a first time investor to take into these, or these are more for nuanced investors to look at? <sighs> I think I I categorize sectoral funds into two types. Uh, one which are very very cyclical in nature, and one which are secular in nature. So. For example, if I look at, say, uh, uh, FMCG, right? I mean, you're not going to stop consuming soaps. You're not going to stop having a cup of tea and so on and so forth, right? So, it's a non-cyclical business. I have, you know, uh, and and that can always have uh, some percentage space in your portfolio. Second such sector is pharma. Look, I mean, it's not that you can ever live without medicine. Yeah. And... Uh, as India is aging constantly, right, the demographics over next few years will change in the favor of slightly old age, I think uh, medicines will be required. But at the same time, there are cyclical structures like maybe, you know, infrastructure, Structure. technology to extend because we are dependent on US dollar movement, etc, etc, right. Um, tech extremely evolving sector things can change disruption can happen the company which is doing very very well suddenly goes out of business so uh, those sectors should be bought tactically when they are completely cheap corrected you want to make get in make lot more money but at some point of time you get out of it so basically uh, it it also comes down to how much risk you can take for absolutely. sectoral funds absolutely risk understanding Standing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is more question like if a mutual fund has been underperforming yes. for a period yes till how long should you make it run or is there something which we can uh, is it better to switch into a better performing uh, fund in that category yeah. or should we wait it out and see how it is i would uh, say give uh, fund so look at much more longer term track record of the scheme uh, of different cycles right equity has market has cycles uh, you had a period of 2000 to 2003 where markets didn't go anywhere. In fact, it corrected, reached the bottom. 3 to 7, end, 8, beginning, bull run with intermediate correction. 8 to 2014 or 13, middle, 13 end, absolutely flattish market with a pop in 2009-10, right? So, they are very, very cyclical. I think if I had to uh, take a decision, I would look at the performance of this fund across various cycles and I would say that if I have passed through the whole cycle eventually the fund has done very very well so there will be schemes which will do very well in bull run there will be actually schemes which will do actually very well in bear phase right and if you know that this manager to whom you have given money over the bull and bear phase I think he has delivered returns which are as per your need you should wait it out is my view um to me, seeing performance and investing or seeing performance and taking decision is like driving uh, ahead with constant eye on the rear view mirror. You don't usually do that. Yeah. So, I think according to your risk, you have to absolute me measure. Absolutely. There will be, because of the nature of the market, you have cyclicality. There will be some times where the fund uh, tends to underperform. Yes. But actually, maybe your underperforming fund has taken some bets which yes. might turn around at the right Absolutely. Of your view. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now we have comes to some questions on goals. Suppose you want to buy a car, you want to go on a vacation. Yes. Uh, for you have a horizon of one to two years. Is it better to keep it in banks or mutual fund also can 
work for these short term horizons also get you better return the mutual funds can for the short term horizon also get you better return but uh, i think uh, for the shorter horizon the rec- more recommended funds are fixed income funds or uh, maybe you know con- conservative asset allocation funds so on a tax free basis i think mutual fund will do well if you have a very 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 short term goal then anyways you have those liquidity funds right currently i think even liquid funds are delivering uh, more than 6% return yeah. so you have a horizon of even 3 days and i don't think there's a three day goal but for the three days also you get that 6% so i think uh, it's better to be into mutual fund also sometimes what happens is uh, and this is my view uh, while i'm sitting in a bank and i'm saying this that uh, sometimes opportunities may come uh, within your goal because you know market gives you an opportunity to add something to your portfolio if the money is lying into mutual fund it's easy to move that money there will always be a inertia to move it from the bank you know that's just human being, being yeah. and that's about it so i would say mutual fund have the system you can go for it uh, so we have one more questions on retirement so one yeah. is uh, one is uh, this particular client is around 35 years sure. and wants to invest for retirement yes and is a new investor yes. what suggestion would you give him ah if i was sitting in front of you right now and i am looking at 35 and you know we 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 sign up for uh, a most of the chunk for retirement because you know the current cash flow anyways will take care of my short term need i would go i would go aggressive equity and at the same time i will also sign up that i'm not going to get shaken up with one year two year three year volatility because there will be binary events that will come and it may shake up your portfolio a bit but you are at 35 you have like another 30 years to go on your side i will go equity and uh, this is on the other like the, uh, the person is retired 67 years old uh, how should he do his investments now so the gentleman who is 60 70 years old was 30 years old at some time maybe planned the retirement corpus maybe bought lot of equity sir time to move that to fixed, fixed income. income do it now if you haven't done it if you are going to put fresh corpus because you have retired you got a huge lump of money from your organization right now i think stay with fixed income it is not uh, had market been very very cheaper maybe would have added equity but i think 70% 75% 80% fixed income the other question is on emergency funds uh, when we talk to clients they yeah. keep an emergency fund yes. which is usually for one year horizon yes. uh, is this the best way to invest this would be in liquid funds or ultra liquid or ultra liquid, liquid. i would go for ultra liquid rather than liquid i think the way i will plot it is that if my money emergency funds are for couple of months only then liquid is the best one anything upwards of 2 months 3 months i would go to ultra liquid category uh for the simple reason that liquid funds don't buy papers more than 2 months ultra liquid buys papers for 3 months to 12 months today a two month paper is available for 7% a nine month paper is available for 770 why should you not buy 50 70 bips or 0.7% extra return i think again quite a few questions are coming on uh, the dividend and growth payout sure. sure for things so maybe we can just revisit that uh, if you have been invested in a dividend pay fund should you now move into growth i would say you should move to growth and if you need the cash flow of dividend then do a swp but i would say blindly move to growth growth yes blindly move to growth and uh, the other one is on uh, cap protection schemes how are these uh, is it uh, whether you prefer this or do you recommend debt funds are better i would say capital protection funds are hybrid funds which means they buy oh almost 80 85% into fixed income that fixed income anyways that 85 rupees becomes 100 rupees because you get interest on those papers coupons on those papers and with that balance 20 they invest into equity even in the open ended space such products are available they used to be erstwhile called mips now yeah. they are called uh, you know at least we call it regular saving fund i'm sure some other fund calls it something else or more conservative hybrid funds what as a category it is been defined by sebi so capros are also not a bad product uh, i think the only difference between a mi a uh, uh, mi uh, conservative hybrid category versus a uh, capro would be that in capro you are locked in so you get more discipline and here you are not locked in so maybe you uh, maybe you uh, 
can get little jittery but i think fixed income also serves the purpose it gives you liquidity and it will give you a similar experience like capital so why not add liquidity to it the other one is on uh, uh, how do you compare mf with pms so uh, and P- is pms uh, for first time investor a good strategy or first stick to mf start to your investment journey with mfs and then pms because they are more focused more gradually upgraded to those yeah so i would uh, for the first time customers uh, i would go with uh, mutual fund uh, while we also will have a pms business etc etc uh simple reason that uh, i think pms are slightly more customized and i believe that most of the pmss are very very small cap oriented and if the pms is large cap oriented then why be into pms because anyways mutual fund is available for that right so uh, i would i would stick to i would stick to mutual funds at this point of time in fact um i would stick to or uh, because i'm a first time customer i would stick to a asset allocation fund, fund rather than pure equity and then you are adding a layer of pms to that no how does equity savings funds come into this category is it also a way of uh, getting a first uh, uh, investor to move into equity absolutely months. absolutely because they are also a brilliant asset allocation fund on the conservative side they typically have 20 to 40% into equity uh, which at least in our case we manage it very very dynamically so uh, they are a good starting point at this point of time so uh, equity savings as a category or balance advantage as a category followed by aggressive hybrid as a category which is pure balance old pure balance fund you know this is this is this is the ladder which one should move uh this question on sip uh, yeah. i if you are doing an sip of say 5000 per month yes. or 10000 per month yes how long should you continue and sh- is there something like you do a perpetual sip or should you keep uh, reviewing it uh, or how long should you review it rebalance it what's your views on that so i think uh, uh first chalk out uh, Uh, the purpose for which you are doing the SIP, and while doing the SIP itself, you make sure that you have done the scheme selection rightly. So take that proper advice on 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 it. I do perpetual SIPs. I personally do perpetual SIPs uh, for the simple reason that a uh, to me SIP is not only as I said not only rupee cost averaging concept because rupee cost averaging. Uh, can also happen upward right do you ever want to average upward you usually usually say let's average it so you you the general impression is i'm going to buy lower and lower and lower but sip is uh, in the last one year for example as average actually upwards uh, markets have just kept on going up so i would do perpetual um, unless until you are doing very goal based financial planning and you say this is my 10 year goal so for this i'll do a 10 year sip and this is my 50 year goal so i'll do a 50 year sip i usually do perpetual SIP. it keeps it simple and i don't rebalance it i i try to get it right when i'm starting it uh so now it's uh questions coming ulips or mutual funds uh, what's your view there and i think they're two different baskets they're two so. different baskets and it will be not right for me to comment on on ulips so uh, i can only say why what is what what are the four things that i may want to highlight about mutual fund a liquidity uh, of course you have a time horizon there is no need to remove it but there is liquidity which is uh, which is much more better in mutual fund uh, second is uh, the cost structures our expense is are capped by the regulator they are uh, available for anyone to see on the website and then whatever you see on the website is what you pay for and that's about it uh, third is of course transparency but there i would not say that ulips are not transparent i'm sure you can see your portfolio yeah. even in ulips etc etc uh, so i would only put it this way that your your efficiency on expenses and your liquidity on the mutual fund side uh it's a much 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 better vehicle i would i have personally separated my uh risk coverage of insu- through insurance by way of buying a term so i say that look this is what is going to cover my risk and my investments is mutual fund so i have divided it i would not comment on no, what will be shown about the one interesting question here has come uh, is uh, uh 
do they exit product where an investor can make a bullet payment based on his risk profile and investment horizon and help create uh, investment according to his investment class? So I sorry, I didn't get the question. Means you make a bullet, uh, is there, so I think he's talking of asset allocation funds or the balance fund category, right. maybe you can uh, elude in that because now with the new SEPI classification, there are yes. quite a few balance fund. So according to the customer's risk or his investment horizon, yes. how does should he be investing in these balance funds? I think uh, I think uh, my first choice will be balance advantage as a category because uh, what I see is the balance category which you know SEBI has renamed as aggressive hybrid category uh, is a very static 65-35 category. I like balance advantage as a category lot more because it gives a leeway to move from 30 to 80 percent equity. So, at the current valuations, it will be 30, 35 percent equity. If the market currency will actually go all the way up to 80 percent equity. And hence, I said that if you're, I heard the word retirement into this, and then moment I see retirement, I, I start saying that you know, fill it, shut it, forget it. I would do it in a dynamically managed asset allocation fund, which is typically available in balance advantage fund category. I think we'll take one last question sure. is uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, why does performance vary so much between different mutual funds in the similar categories uh, what's your take on that uh, how how should an investor do it I think what investors face is they see the one year two year three yeah. year return but when you see five years most of the funds are ideally are, would are converge very, right? yeah, absolutely, absolutely absolutely so over that one year period there is lot more divergence over a five year period the divergence is maybe 100 basis points 150 basis points and you cannot predict show me a person who can tell me which is going to be higher by 100 basis points right and if somebody can predict that for you I can only tell you that person is lying to you uh, because it is impossible to predict uh, where does the divergence comes uh, look there is a divergence today in some of the sector some of the stocks within the market so I'll give you some example and while I I don't intend, I don't see any reason why I should be talking about stocks, but just to give you a very, very simple example, some of the pharma stocks in the last one year were very, very beaten down. At the same time, some of the good retail banking franchisee or NBFC franchisee has done very, very well. Uh, within the automobile space, for example, if you are into a passenger vehicle like uh, say Maruti, that stock has done very, very well. If you are into Tata Motors, which is commercial vehicle and, and also a bit of passenger vehicle, that stock has not done very well. So it is, the divergence in performance will come because every fund manager will have a particular view and basis that he will construct the portfolio. And in the short run, that view may not necessarily play out. So for somebody who plays out will have better performance, somebody who does not play out will have not so great performance. However, over five years, I think eventually the fund manager's own hidden incentive or hidden agenda is that look, I have to do very, very well for my portfolio because you know, uh, that's where I get my fame and my money. Yes. So, uh, so I think over five years, don't worry too much. On one year, if there is divergence, don't worry too much. And that on one year divergence will be very, very steep. Yeah. You will actually see 7-8% possible divergence also. But that's going to all get ironed out over 5 years. Thank you so much, Amar. Okay. Thank uh, you. Uh, viewers and investors, we will a survey will be popping up soon in your screen. Please answer that and give us our, give the feedback on the webinar. As well as we look forward to engaging with you in case you want that. Uh, our advisors will get in touch with you. I hope this uh, webinar was very useful. It was quite an engaging session and helps you in your mutual fund, in your journey, on your investment journey through mutual funds. Thank you all for logging in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.